I want to welcome everybody to the long show. I'm here with my guest, Gary Lambero, the, the fire chief. We got some, you got some really good news that just recently came by your way. Yeah, last Thursday evening at the Finance Organization Personnel Committee, we, uh, we asked them to recommend to the council to allow the city manager to negotiate and execute an agreement with a uh, design build team for the new central fire station. And uh, the Finance Organization Personnel Committee on a 5-0 vote forwarded it to council for this Thursday evening. So you're pretty sure you can get three more councils so you can get it passed? I hope so. <laughs> and um, I just think, no pun intended, it's really been a long road <laughs> <laughs> for your fire station. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. Uh, there's been a lot of work put into this, uh, not only from myself, but from past chiefs and uh, administrators throughout the city, councilors. This is a this is a project that's been going on for quite some time and has been a lot of people involved in it. And so last week we went out to the, the fire station. We took a lot of on-site video. And so what we're going to do, instead of repeating things over and over again, we're just going to run the video for the on-site interview. That'd be great. And uh, I think people will be quite surprised at what the fire station looks like, quite different inside than outside. Sure does. Robert's the host of The Long Road. I'm here with the fire chief. Hi, nice, nice to see you. Yeah, nice to be here. <laughs> Aren't you going to tell I guess what your name is? Oh, my name is Gary Lamro. And so we're in front of the fire station, Central Fire Station in Keene, yes. which has had a lot of controversy over the, the last 10 to 15 years. Could you tell us the view is how old is this building? Uh, the original building was built in 1885, which is the last two bays down on the right. Uh, after the uh, the city got together and decided to start to bring all the different departments or the different uh, fire companies across the city into one area that was centrally located. And shortly thereafter, it worked so well, they added on the rest of the building, and then they started, uh, that was the, actually the original city of Keene Fire Department at that point. Is it true to the rumors that this used to be a horse-drawn fire station right here? Yeah, all the, uh, all the bays were designed and the, the rear of the building was designed up to house horses in hand-drawn and horse-drawn equipment, and that's what the building was originally designed to uh, hold. But back in 1885, there wasn't any uh, motorized apparatus. As a number of people know, my military career, I was a professional engineer. And you, as a city council member, you brought me through this building a couple of times. When I took a quick look at the building, it came to me that it would cost more to upgrade this building than build a brand new fire station. Yeah, the original estimates to rebuild this building was actually more than to build a brand new structure. And the reasons for that is that this building would have to be um, secured all the way around the building in order for them to do any work on it. That presents a whole lot of issues for us because there's no place for us to park our equipment in the, in the meantime while this building is being rebuilt. It doesn't make a lot of sense to rebuild this structure cost-wise. We do know that traditionally, you know, there's a lot of tradition and history of the building and we don't want to see that go away which it's not going to, it's part of the uh, historic register. So the building itself will historically will remain intact, uh, but for a fire station, a modern fire station, it just does not meet the needs anymore. I would also look at, at the foundation. We talked about being hush drawn. How do you put some of these trucks, like the hook and ladder, on something which we all know wasn't built for that way? Well, the main part of this building, um, back in, the, in 1925, there was three stories on this building and they had a fire when they were out on another call and burned the third floor off. So at that point they rebuilt the structure and in 1925 they rebuilt the base, the basement area where there was a full basement of the way these trucks are sitting and put larger steel yeah. col columns and, and steel beams in. It still isn't designed to hold the weights that we're putting on today. Uh, an average pumper fire truck that you see behind you is about 15 and a half tons. So in order for, for this building to hold up, it's showing its stress cracks and, and it just cannot hold the weight any longer. Even the Clydesdale is going to weigh that much. No. When we look at this, it's packed. How many vehicles do you have inside this building? Right? You're putting me on the spot, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> you're the boss, you're the expert. Um, the larger apparatus, we have the two pumps sitting here and a new rescue that we just got in. Just to, to give you an idea on space, uh, we had to design that truck to fit into this building. And when it was delivered, we actually had to take the steel off the, the ceiling in order to make the truck fit. So those are the types of things that nobody can get on top of that truck and do the work and the maintenance on that truck that it needs to happen. It has to be done outside. We have a, a ladder bay on the uh, left side of this building. It was built in 1972. And that hold, houses a tanker, which is a 2,500-gallon uh, tanker, and a 110-foot ladder truck. That's not sitting on a basement. That's sitting on the, uh, a concrete pad. The issues with that bay over there is that the only person that can get into those trucks is the driver. Uh, this is just
just not enough space and maybe we'll see later in the video that uh, you'll see what the space needs are over in that area. We have two ambulances here and a brush truck, paramedic unit, and a four-wheeler. And then in the rear of the building, which is unheated, we keep uh, our rescue boat and sometimes uh, some of the other equipment that we just don't have any space for. Now I'm really going to put you on the spot. Okay. What are all the stuffed animals in the fire apparatus? Well, basically, uh, they're good luck charms. <laughs> um, every, if, if you go across the country, every, uh, every fire station has their little uh, <coughs> mascot. And years ago, it used to be a real dog. And today, uh, you know, the guy's gone as much yeah. as they are. There's no chance to be able to take care of a, a real pet. So those are our, our mascots <laughs> that they put in the trucks. Well, I know um, about seven years ago, my, my grandson had a major accident, shattered it, his elbow. The paramedics, they came there in a hot beat, and they gave him a stuffed animal. Yeah. He still sleeps with that stuffed <laughs> animal. I can't tell people he's nine years old. I won't tell you which his name is, but he still sleeps with that Oh, I still do animal. too, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the, um, and one other thing, what was it, about six weeks ago, we had an earthquake. And it was a small one compared to California, but it was, what, about 0.5 up by the Quebec area. We'll be, later on, we'll be able to show that the people, this is not earthquake proof. This has had some substantial damage of earthquakes over the years. That's correct. Not only earthquakes, but believe it or not, when uh, they were rebuilding Port Street, uh, pulling the concrete out and Washington Street, we've actually accumulated another large crack up on the second floor in, in one of the walls, based just from them moving that. Um, what an earthquake proof building does for you, it's called seismic uh, construction. And they put extra uh, supports and braces in. So that, right. This building here is actually sitting on, by guessing, <laughs> uh, the forensic, forensic engineers are telling it's sitting on a fault line? Is well, it, no, it's actually sitting on a clay base oh, that, well, that was put fly. in. Yeah. And what's really, uh, this building, whether you say that it's good or bad, this building's able to sway a little bit if we do have an earthquake, whereas a structure that is built today with steel beams in the ground, uh, it's a lot more uh, solid. So yeah, a lot of people don't don't understand that Keene is a dry lake bed. Correct. And it's dry in some areas. Dry in some areas. <laughs> yep. If you go up by Butterfly Park, that's all wet up around North Lake. But if you really want to understand it, Look at the 89 earthquake in San Francisco. Right. When you're in this type of soil, the soil can liquefy in an earthquake, and it would not do you any good for your building to sink. You don't get out of it. Correct. And, it, and one of the reasons they have those codes now is basically that they don't want emergency services incapacitated due to those reasons. They want the best chance that they can have to be able to respond. And so we're out here. We're going to swing over, and, and we'll talk a little bit about where the new fire station is going sure. to go. So now, every fireman's dream, especially your dream, the city council has approved the new fire station. And right now we're going through the process of um, picking who's gonna build it. And then we'll go out to bid, <coughs> excuse me, to hopefully get it under budget of what up to $5 million that the city's already paid for. Uh, yeah, it, it is a, a dream. However, the need for, for the firefighters to be able to provide the best service they can. Uh, we, we're having a difficult time providing it out of the station. So health-wise, with the, you know the exhaust systems and open stairwells and those types of things, all of that go away. We'll have the proper uh, air handling systems to be able to, to be able to move the, the air. So protection of our guys, uh, the firefighters, is, is really high in my mind. That this building is going to be a much safer building for them to operate out of. Beside being able to order equipment that we need. To fit in, that will fit into the building and be able to operate. Without spending all that extra cost on design. These are custom trucks because we have to design them to fit into the station. The other ones will be custom, but um, they've actually built trucks that size, so you're able to use, use some of the other blueprints to be able to build them. Uh, this, is, this is history. Uh, anybody who's been involved in this all the way back 15 years, this is going to be history. We've had one fire station built in the city of Keene in history. And this will only be the second one, so it's it's going to be a, a nice project. Uh, but again, it's the need that we uh, we want to be able to build this for, for the community, and it's going to be great. <clears throat> you have to be graduate because you always look at you want a quality building, but you're always looking out for the taxpayers' interest. 
Martha Landry, our, our great finance, the Wiz. Yeah. I keep telling John she belongs in the state because the state has problems. The state should be as lucky as we are. You're not taking it. No, we're not taking it. <laughs> we're going to be selfish in here because I don't want my taxes going any high just like you. But when this originally started, we were looking what eight, eight and a half million dollars for this building. Yeah, the original project when we first started uh, definitely was was well above what we're looking at today. Uh, it was some of the, some of the project estimates were coming in at eight, eight and a half uh, million, and uh, over time, you know, maybe it's a good thing that we've actually had to wait a little bit in order to build this building because we're going to save the taxpayers quite a bit of money over what we were originally going to build. And one of the proposals of um, putting in 350 Marlboro feet. That was going to cost, renovation was going to cost more than a brand new fire station. Yeah, it's not like we can just take and build some rooms down there and, and move our trucks in. Uh, there was a lot of work that needed to be done down there, including making that a up to code building for us, which is seismic, and uh, the roof structure uh, would have to be upgraded in order to meet, a, meet the standards today. So, as when they built the police department, they had to actually tear down walls and rebuild new walls in order to do that. They would have to do the same with the fire department. And that, there's a considerable cost to that. Whereas you're building new and you build as you're building up, you're putting all those, those components into it. Uh, it's a lot cheaper doing it that way than have to tear it all down and start over again and build back up again. And again, going back to, to Martha Landry, for the people who haven't seen the FOP committees, this is really a, a great time to build, to finance. There's a lot of construction companies, construction management companies, they're hurting for work, so the prices have come down. Right. The bond issue, the interest rate, is really low. We may get an interest at two, two and a half percent instead of the five or six percent, saving the taxpayers a couple of million dollars over the cost of the bond. Now, as this project has started, um, if you recall back when we when we were looking at this project, we wanted to be able to get some of that uh, American Recovery Act money, and we were very competitive in that process. However, we unfortunately weren't able to receive any of that money, and in that process, uh, in order to be build ready or what they called shovel ready, we needed to uh, have a process that we could start building immediately if we got that money. So that's why we started looking at this design build process and as we've gone through it, we've, we've found that this process is actually starting to become one of the ways to build across the United States because you end up saving money on architectural costs, you save money on change orders. So as this process has gone on, we decided to stick with it even though we didn't receive any of that money because it is, it is a uh, much better way to build and again, you save money doing it that way. Uh, according to the contractors that we've spoken to prior to us going this way, they've all said that you get a much better project out of it because you're actually all building the building together. Your architect, your engineer, and your contractor along with the owner are all building the building together as you go. So it, you end up with a, a, what we consider a much better building. Again, in the military, whether it's Navy, Marine Corps, Army, in their facilities, Every engineer, we have a big, thick book like this, and it's drawn, so if we need to build a fire station or a hangar, it's already there. The architect's there, all the plumbing, utilities, the cost, the material take off. You're saving time, you're saving money, you make a few adjustments on the climate. So, again, that's you. I think that's going to be more and more in the public domain because that can make sense and saving time. Yeah, if you have the space to do that, this is kind of a unique situation over here. Uh, based on what we have for land available to us, so you know every fire station has the same the same content. It's just how you design it within that building and what your historic values need to be, that type of thing. So uh, you know we're going to have the same thing that every other new fire station has. It's just maybe designed a little bit different for our operation. Okay, now you're talking about the new fire station. So let's turn. So we're going to put the new fire station directly across from the current fire station. Yeah. Basically, if you uh, if you look across the street here, we uh, purchased a while back the parking lot over here on the corner, which is, used to be the old Fairpoint. The fire department is now currently parking there. We're going to continue to park there even after the new structure is up. Um, across here, there used to be the attorney's office. Uh, there was a radio station there. That building was removed uh, early this year, and in, in order to prep for our new facility. So basically, we're going to be going from Court Street all the way over to Elm Street. Uh, we have this area to be able to build in, and now that we're going to sit down and do the design, once we, we choose a uh, design build team, and that team is consistent of the builder, the architect, and the engineers, uh, we'll sit down and start the design and be able to put a picture to what's going to be going in here. Later on, we're going to have a little bit of filming showing how the um, hook and ladder 
gets out and how difficult that is. Sure. So you're going to, the new building will be offset so we won't have that problem. Yeah, currently the way this was built, um, we didn't have a ladder truck that large when in 1972 when they ordered the truck. So they had to do some scrambling and they found that the only way they could do this is to close in what used to be an alleyway that went back where the horses went back into the rear of the, the station. And that alleyway was closed in in order to fit a, that ladder truck. And of course, as time's gone on, we've replaced that ladder truck. The trucks have gotten bigger. Our needs have get, are getting better, bigger with all the buildings that are going up in the city. Uh, that demand is forcing a lot of uh, more newer technology, higher ladder trucks. Uh, so, yeah, because if you go over to railroad, we have a lot of four-story buildings. Right. You got four and five-story buildings. Uh, now they're talking about some other structures that may be going up in the city that are a little bit larger. Uh, you got six stories at 21 Roxbury Plaza. You have seven stories at 5 Central Square, Roxbury Plaza. So we, we definitely have the facilities to warrant the truck. It's just the way that we had to build that, it's on an angle. And when they come out of the station, as you'll see in a little while, we actually have to do some maneuvering in order to get the trucks out. It's not a clean response. That type of response, especially uh, when you're getting the couple of fires that we had just recently with subjects trapped in a building. Um, as you can imagine, the firefighters adrenaline's pumping a little bit. And they do a great job getting these trucks out. Have we had some issues? Yes, we have. Uh, the ladder trucks had uh, a few years back, we responded to a fire and $9,000 damage. Uh, basically because the truck kind of tilted, not more than probably three or four inches. And it hit the main control box on the, on the back of the truck coming out. And as you'll see when they, they come out of the building, you'll know what, what I'm talking about. The, the old building, which is um, the lawyer's building and the radio station, yes. there was a lot of concern about it being in a historic building. Yes. The city council offered money to help someone if they wanted to take the building and move it, but we had no taking. Right. But when you took down the building, you went through to make sure it was no asbestos and no other hazardous material, but then you offered up some of the other materials there to help recycle it to keep as much as possible out of the dump. Yeah, uh, what, what had originally happened was is we tried to see if anybody would be interested in the building and, and based on cost today and what the uh, value of that structure would be once they moved it, it didn't seem to be cost, a cost effective uh, project for anyone. So we did, we did have to go through the historic district in Keene, which uh, I think that's a, a great program because it does keep the history in the city. They are there yep. to protect the history of the city as they will with this building and as they will because we're in a historic district with a new facility, it's going to have to have some type of his historical value to the to the uh, building itself. So we, we went through that. The Heritage Commission came in and they took pictures inside and out. And unfortunately, over time with that building, uh, all the interior of the building had been rebuilt. There's very minimal uh, historic, value. historic value left in the building. And we actually went through the state of New Hampshire through their historic resource division. And basically, they because there was no federal money going towards this project after we... Uh, we weren't awarded, it falls back to the local community and they they voted to have us be able to tear the building down. Not without some um, hesitation yeah. and that's what they're there for. I mean, that's why they're, they're in those honest. positions. It, yeah, and it, it somebody needs to protect that historic value. Yeah, we don't want to destroy downtown and just have plain boxes, steel Correct. buildings. Type yes. When you're talking about the historic portion, so the new fire station will be, um, the facade will be almost like the current fire station. Yeah, there's criteria that the Historic uh, Commission will have us incorporate into that building, which for the fire <laughs> service, we love that because we like the tradition. And, you know, the arch doorways and those types of things that we'll probably have to have anyway is something we'd be looking to do. One of the other um, concerns that some people have what are we going to do with this building? Some people say just sell it, put it on the tax rolls. But is that really the best interest for the city and surrounding communities? Well, I know I don't feel that way, and I know the city manager, has, has John McLean, has said the same thing, that uh, we had a proposal from Southwest District Fire Mutual Aid. Southwest District Fire Mutual Aid right now is uh, dispatching for 68 communities in this area, including Mass, Vermont, and New Hampshire. And the reason that's important is, is currently right now they're in a small area. They're in a, a, an area that, first of all, doesn't even meet their size requirements for an industry standard for dispatching. Um, but the reason that it's important that, that these guys and, and gals stay where they are, because first of all, they do an excellent job, 
And they're also the ones who, when we're looking for help to fight a fire and those types of things, they're the, the organization that actually gets us the help. They have resources that are listed out uh, in their dispatch center that they can get resources from anywhere in the state of New Hampshire, Mass, and Vermont to come here. And they do an excellent job with it. And a lot of people are looking at them saying, well, they're just in this small area. Why do they need this entire building? Well, the reason they need it is they have multiple pieces of equipment stored all over the city of Keene. Uh, some of it's command, command trailers. Uh, they have a training trailer that they can go to all these different communities. They, they dispatch for to, to do safety training for kids, for communities. Uh, they have, I can't remember how many uh, radio antenna sites that they have. They have to maintain, they have to have equipment to do that. And also they have a radio repair shop, which uh, right now they have three people in that division with vehicles that they have to travel around. They're going to move all of that into this one facility. As a matter of fact, I think they're going to be tight getting all their apparatus and, and organizations within one building. Uh, but this building here, we have to all remember that we all pay to have this service. And if they have to move out of this, this building and move somewhere else, they're looking at at least one and a half million dollars to be able to do that, which all of these communities would have to pay for. And in a lot of these communities, small communities, can't afford to do that, nor can the city of Keene. So as we looked at it, we looked at what's the best for, for the region, what's best for the city of Keene, and what's best for the Southwest District Mutual Aid, which, by the way, started in this building. This is one of the first mutual aid systems to ever go into effect, which has been supported by the city of Keene since its, in, its inception. And um, with them remaining in this building, they get a, they get a, a place where they can stay. They don't have to spend a million dollars to move their equipment. They don't have to build another structure. They have the structure to be able to fit it. They don't need any extra parking. And more importantly, they want to keep the building as historic as they, they can. And to the point where they're going to look for grants to put it back to its original look with the original doors and that type of thing. So we're pretty excited about that. But also, they provide dispatch service that we don't have to pay for, right? Correct. If we would have to provide that dispatch, we would have to, uh, first of all, buy all the equipment, which, again, you're looking at approximately a million dollars just to buy the equipment that we would need to do that and have personnel to do it. And I can assure you that we are probably 10% of that is what we're paying to have four dispatches on duty at all times to be able to handle our calls. And when you, when you talk about the, the million dollars, that million dollars has to do a lot with the communication and the microwave system because if you go to a three alarm fire, they'll get another community to backfill for you right here. Correct. As you'll see in the paper and a lot of our press releases, we have three or four towns in here covering Keene while we have a structure fire for it. Uh, before the mutual aid system was intact, it was basically you're winging it. And you know, you go out on call. You may not have anybody in the city of Keene handling the next call. So if you went to a three alarm all the way in east part of Keene, and then all of a sudden my house starts burning down in west Keene, and it's kind of like, sorry, you're out of luck because we don't have any fire coverage. Correct. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen now. So again, that's the, the benefit of um, Southwest Mutual Aid. Yes. And again, we're getting more than our money's worth because they provide radio techs and they provide dispatches. Yes. But most of all, we get safety coverage and all the people in Keene always has fire protection no matter where a current fire is located. Right. And the other, the other part of that is, is uh, anyone who has had to call 911, uh, th that will go to a different location and it, they transfer it down here. And they do what they call EMD dispatching, which is they'll actually explain to you on the phone what to do if uh, you have a, a patient that's down on the floor and not breathing, that type of thing. They're actually trained to go through that process and, and be able to do CPR and, and those types of things. And also when we're operating at a fire, uh, the procedures that they use now is to keep us honest uh, to make sure that we don't forget because when you're operating at a fire scene, it goes by very fast, that they every 20 minutes we do what they call a PAR check and it's a personnel accountability report where we have to actually call all the people operating in that building or on the scene and say, all right, who do you have and how many? So that we can continue to keep track of those those firefighters in the building. Yes, because sometimes when you talk about being on adrenaline, you want to do the job. But when you're so pumped up doing the job, you may make a little mistake that may injure someone or Good. cost someone's life. Good. So like you said, this is keeping honest yes. to protect the, the occupancy. That's correct. Okay. Maybe now we can hopefully get the hook and ladder out. Sure can.
the basement of the uh, the old fire station and show you what's underneath uh, the fire trucks and what's holding us up. So, Chief, you got these old lanterns. How old are these? Those are those are the ones that actually go on the uh, old hand tub. Pick on your chief. Is this why you, uh, they always have short chiefs so you can get downstairs? <laughs> it's kind of dangerous. Okay, watch your head down here because a lot of these brackets are hanging down and they'll cut you really, really bad. Yeah. Um, this is a, uh, right now we're standing in an area that's under engine one. Uh, last year we had this new column put into place because the floor was cracking and the I beams were all rusted out. And what we've done is put that beam in there to try and support the structure long enough so that we can build a new facility. It's important to note that if we remain in this building, even if we weren't to do anything, uh, there are a lot of code updates and ADA updates that need to be completed, which is going to cost a lot of money. We really, if you're looking at ADA, how in the world do you make this ADA? You just can't get down here. No, it's the whole building set up that way. It's all open stairwells. There's no ADA bathrooms. Um, it's it needs a lot of work for coming up the code for us. And I would have to say anybody at six foot is ADA. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> <clears throat> but basically, uh, this is the basement that, and the, the flooring itself looks like it's got concrete, but it's it's really just I mean, this stuff just peels right up. It's our clay base, from what they're telling me. And like we were talking before, as we come, it's a good thing the wires are color coded. Yeah, the, it's what you know, it's like this is a nightmare on these wires. A lot of this wiring is actually discontinued, and over the years they didn't uh, take the wiring out; they just replaced it and kept adding and adding. And as you can see, the snarl that's uh, everywhere throughout this basement, we don't even really know what it is. A lot of it's dispatch wiring. So if you don't know what it is, and one breaks, yeah, we don't touch nothing. <laughs> don't touch nothing. If it works. Don't say. We try to keep the squirrels yeah, and watch out for your head. Yeah, I don't hit that. Oh. We have to use this for a lot of storage. Uh, it's not very good storage, but basically, these two rooms. This is our EMS supply room, which takes care of all of our medical equipment. This is the only area we have for it. Uh, it's not the best place for it, but uh, we turn it over quick enough so that we don't have any issues usually. I would think a lot of people wouldn't be very comfortable looking at, at this. It's a, like I said, it, the guys do a good job keeping it neat and clean and making sure that there's no, no damage. We've got dehumidifiers. And this area here is for our dispatch center. This is where the, the brains of the dispatch area are. Uh, this isn't the best location for it. Again, moisture in the electronic equipment isn't uh, the best. Dust. You can see dust. You can see we have fans. The other issue that we have is there's so many cracks in the floor upstairs that the water and moisture raining down so we have to be very careful with where we can put water in this building. If we're talking about, look at the crack in that, that wall right over there. Right. Yeah, that's the main, as you can see, it's a granite foundation throughout this building. And that wall that you're looking at right here, that granite foundation, is actually the original wall. Of the yeah. You guys do a great job with the limitations you have. But this is really, you only have so much life left in this building. Something's yeah. going to go happen. Yeah, it's at, we want to get out of here before we have something catastrophic happen because of the weights and those types of things. But, um, you know, the building may last another 100 years. Who knows? Uh, the way it was built. I mean, you look at some of the buildings across the city, they're still but, standing. Yeah, the building may last 100 years, but its functionality right. as a fire station. Correct. It may function something as something else for many more years. But if I was a private business person, no way would I risk my business with the facility that you have right now, right? Your communications, your computer. As you can see behind me, uh, it looks like a, a big rat's nest. But what we use this area for down in the basement is for our, our firefighters to be able to certify in their self-contained breathing apparatus. They put the gear on and they have to put the pack on. And there's tubes that go through here. We have to actually crawl through. Some of the guys have to take their packs off, put them in front of them and push through. I know in the smaller one, um, I go through on my toes and my fingernails. <laughs> but that, this is designed to do that. And these uh, ropes simply hanging wires, that type of thing that they can get hung up in. And so it's, it, you said earlier they were blacked out? Yeah, they black out the face mask so they can't see anything. 
and then they go on air and come through. And for a lot of people, that's pretty stressful. You just have no idea where you're going. Yeah, yeah anybody who's claustrophobic shouldn't be in this business. But once you get into that tube over there, you've got, it doesn't seem like a long ways, but when you're trying to crawl through that on your fingernails and your toes trying to get through an area, it's, uh, you can get a little, a little leery in there. Again, using ingenuity to save the taxpayers money, but keep the guys trained. Correct. And um, here's one, just pop my, do you have any female firefighters? We actually do not. We had a coal firefighter who was a female who just uh, moved to, I believe it was New York. So at, currently at the time, we have no fe female firefighters, but we have had in the past. Okay. The, when people talk about this, it's funny because when you go to Marine Corps OCS, the first thing they do is they put you in a hole, totally dark, and if you don't make it, you go home, they don't waste the time training. Right. So they, do they do that with firemen at the beginning? Well, or? basically most of the firefighters <laughs> that are coming to us have already had some training, and if they're certified in either one or two, they'll mm -hmm. usually be washed out before they make it to us to be hired. You're okay. Some of the uh, problems that we've had with this building structurally is, that you, as you can see, the steel plates on the walls, uh, we had a forensic forensic engineer come through and look at the building just give us an idea of what was going on with the building because of some of the cracks that it, uh, are starting to form. These two areas here, as you can see, are right underneath the main carrying beam. And what was happening is they cracked during one of the earthquakes and the cracks were getting larger. And it, the forensic engineer was very worried about the structure and how it was built originally. So what they've done is they've taken these plates and they've sandwiched it together on each side of the wall and bolted it to keep that wall together and keep the stability underneath the beam for the second floor. There's one here and there's one down here uh, that, that are doing the same. Throughout the building there's cracks uh, that have formulated whether they're in the floor and in the walls and there's a crack over here over the archways that they were really concerned with because it's the uh, main carrying area and it looks like it's actually pulling in. So uh, that was one of the things that concerned us during the original process for the evaluation. This is their uh, kitchen area where they actually get a chance to break, have a break and some coffee. This is where they eat lunch. Um, the cooking facilities are upstairs uh, in a normal facility, a new facility. That would all be together so that they, they're all in the same area. Um, this is the only air conditioned area. Basically, this is the training room for any type of climate control for them to be able to rehab and come back. Because when they come back with their gear on and stuff, they're very hot. And there's a lot of people out there, a lot of firefighters out there that they are finding it are dehydrated so that it's causing them uh, physical damage to their, to their organs. So a couple of weeks ago when we had that stretch of 97, 98 degrees, how hot does this building get? Oh, well, the building gets very hot. Uh, the second floor can get up into the hundreds without a problem. Uh, the humidity does not come out of this building. So basically, you know, we train, we try and rehab them and tell them to stay in an area that's cool because they do have a call. We need them to be ready. And so it could be borderline sauna type conditions. It can be on some days. It can be. And we all know sauna is quite draining. I don't want no fire to pump. Fire guy coming to me who's been right. drained. And so these guys are sitting in this weather. They work 11 hour days and 13 hour nights. So when they're when they're actually on duty, we've got to try and keep them as best we can. And they do a pretty good job with it. Um, the, the fire service has done a great job over the last few years about taking care of physical and, and uh, mental health for the firefighters. So. A lot of our guys here are doing a good job with that. You okay? All right, Jim. Chief, you're missing all the fun. I'm bringing them with me. Kill it. No cameras allowed in this area. <laughs> I think some bitten. This is the uh, training facility. This is basically where, where all our training is done. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty tight in here. We don't have a lot of area for the. Uh, putting up the new technology and that type of thing. So this is uh, this this is not very conducive to good training, but in a new facility we'll be able to have all the all the new technology. Well if this was a classroom at the high school or the middle school the parents would be carried to a pot. Yeah. Most of these guys parents want to be on Oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks guys. Well, actually, the equipment is pretty decent. Uh, we don't have the room that we need. Uh, some, of the, some of this stuff is all commercial grade equipment. Uh, the Stairmaster over here is used for the fire service. This is what they use to test people for their abilities uh, to get hired. So we have one of those here. We have treadmill, of course, and 
some weight equipment. We have an identical setup out to West Keene. Some of this equipment was actually purchased through the city, some was purchased through the union, and they donated it to us. And you have this is one of the typical bedrooms here in, in the fire department. We usually have about 10 bedrooms. We're down to, uh, I think we got seven bedrooms now. We have 10 people working. But with West Keene out there, there's always uh, enough bedrooms to go around. They're individual right now. Uh, there used to be two beds in each room. Uh, based on the industry standards, uh, they found that that's not the best setup anymore. Uh, some people can't get sleep because others are making too much noise. So we're down to, to single beds in each room, which works out pretty well. This bed bedroom here will house four firefighters, one on each shift. So there will always be somebody in here. There's a subservice set. Hot racking. Right. But as we're standing here, if, we're if I'm really honest, this room stinks. You've got a musty smell in it. Yeah. You, I can hear, see it, smell it. They're trying to over overcome it by some deodorants and stuff. But this really stinks. You wouldn't want your kid, if you're home, sleeping in a room like this. That's one of the reasons they, they have the air conditioners in the window to try and dry up this moisture and stuff during the summertime. But like, like I said earlier, this building holds the moisture really, really bad. Um, and to get rid of that moisture, you've got to do things like that and have air handling systems, which we don't have. And I can't see on a hot, muggy night how anybody can sleep here. Yeah. They may rest, but they can't sleep here. It's difficult to sleep anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> anybody who's been in the fire service or military yeah. as yourself, when you're what we call active, which basically is when you're out yeah. on doing your thing, and you, you always know that there's something in the back of your head. Yeah. It's the same way here. They don't get a lot of good sleep here. They may lay down and, like you said, get some rest. rest. But most of the time, uh, it's very difficult to sleep. They're running. The amount of calls that they're running today compared to when you know when I first started here, you used to be able to go two or three nights without even having a call. They're lucky to get out of three or four calls a night. And what happens is if they're ambulance calls, you go out for an hour, you come back, yeah. your adrenaline's up, you have to calm back down again. Once that does, another call comes in. So it's very difficult to get sleep here. The, the old traditional going to the firehouse and sleeping days are pretty much over. This happens, this here is the kitchen area that the uh, firefighters use for cooking. We also use it for dinners. Um, we have a couple of din annual dinners here at the fire department to show appreciation to the firefighters and to the city council and, and department heads. Uh, but basically this is a our kitchen. Um, very difficult to use when the guys are downstairs and they have to come up and downstairs to keep track of things. Uh, it's not the best facility. Uh, it's what we have and we can assure you that in a new facility that it's going to have you know some of the update technology and, and a newer gas, yeah. gas stove. After leaving what you call the bedroom and what you now call a kitchen, you're really stretching. Just because it has a stove and a bed, to me, doesn't make it a kitchen or a bedroom. And in all these shows, they always like to say something that will tick off some people. And I'm going to do it now because if I go to the correctional facility, I would get better facilities and kitchen than I do for the firemen right here. Somehow I don't think that that's right, because we're talking about we need you tip-top shape, ready to go at a moment's notice. In a lot of places, you're really living in crap, but you're making the best of it. But there's a limit how much you can do. Right. It's a... Uh... It's one of those things, this building should have been replaced a long time ago. We understand that the, you know, there's a political process that has to take place. And the community has to feel comfortable with being able to spend that kind of money. I think we're at that point. I think we've, uh, we've gone through, uh, I've been involved in this for seven to nine years now, just myself. And I think we've given all the information we need. And I think we have the support not only from the council, but the community to be able to build a new facility so that you know, the firefighters have something that they can be proud of and have some pride and, and be safe. I think this segment that we went through today will show the public that we need a new fire station. We're not grandstanding it. We're not doing it because you want to have a new fire station, a new castle. It's because we need it, because you need to do it to get this, protect the people of New Hampshire, uh, King in the area. That's correct. It's not about want. It's about need. It's a need. It's way past the need. Yep. And I want to thank you. I think we've you. got a lot of stuff here. It went longer than I thought, but you know what? I think everything that we touch is really important. And I Great. think the people in the community and the Channel 8 watchers will really enjoy what we've seen. Thank you. And anybody who's interested in coming in and coming in, you can take a, take a tour yourself and we can show you around. Okay. So you
So you said anybody who's interested. So as long as you're six feet or under, you can come in and take a tour down the bottom. <laughs> yeah, just in the basement area. Just in the basement area. <clears throat> and um, I think this, was, this covered a, a lot of um, things. Before I went through the building, I didn't realize how old and decrepit the building was. I don't think most people understand it. I think when you, when you live in the building, and you know, we've been in there for a long time, we're used to it. Um, it's not the best atmosphere for us, but we know that we're there to provide a service. And if you talk to any of the firefighters, uh, that's what they're there for. They want to go out and provide the service to those people, and they'll do anything they can to, to do that. So the building, uh, definitely it hinders us sometimes, but it doesn't prevent them from doing their job. That, that's a common phase be, between policemen, firemen, military. We're going to do the job. We'll worry about the facilities later. But I think a lot of people don't understand the pressure, the stress, the added injuries and other stuff that goes on trying to do a job without the right equipment, without the right facilities. Yeah, that's true. The, uh, they have shown that there's increased injuries and illness, uh, especially uh, the sicknesses during the, during the winter and, um, and, and those times when the flu is around. Uh, you can't decon the building the way you'd like to. You, you don't have the materials to be able to do that. Plus, you have uh, hundreds more <laughs> of uh, people passing around those bacteria in that building. <laughs> Uh, so with the new air handling system, the new filter systems, to be able to get some of that out of there, it definitely protects your firefighters. And one of the things I want to transition over, I was going to ask something else first, but I'm going to go back to um, the 2005 flood. I don't like the term Homeland Security, maybe crisis control, crisis management, but you and the fire department played a very active role in the 2005 flood. Yeah, uh, I have to give kudos to everybody involved in that process. Uh, we hadn't had a flood like that in here in years. Uh, back when I was a call firefighter and brand new in the fire department, we had a couple of floods on the east side, but nothing to the extent of what we had. So, the, you know, with the new management and, and the support that we had from city council, and more importantly, the, the support that we had from all of the service agencies, public works, fire police, not only local but regionally, uh, as you remember, Alstead was also hit basically at the same time as we were, and uh, they were devastated over there also. So a lot of the resources were taken uh, from both organizations. And that's when the dispatch center in the state of New Hampshire, Homeland Security, and I don't like that name, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, you know, they stepped up to the plate, and, and they were able to get us the resources we needed to be able to, to take care of the situation. And going when you normally have a flood you also run into the problem of hazmat and other areas. And on the city council, your deputy chief with the hazmat, he's done um, a great job of um, getting funds, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Could you explain to some of the viewers? Yeah, we've, we've been lucky enough to gather some of the, the grants that we've had throughout the years. And our hazardous materials team, which we have 31 technicians, uh, and regionally we take care, I think it's... Uh, I can't remember the exact number of towns that we take care of, but basically in this lower area of the, of the state of New Hampshire, we cover that area. And we've been lucky enough to gather a lot of those grants to be able to support the hazardous materials team. And basically, that's what pays for our people. We're able to bill if we have an incident. So uh, as far as the budget goes, it's very minimal. I think we have four or $5,000 in the hazmat account. Uh, but it takes hundreds of thousands of dollars to run that. And uh, Deputy Boyne, uh, excuse me, Deputy Howard just received a hundred and I think it was a hundred one thousand dollar grant, which we've been pretty lucky annually of getting those types of grants uh, to keep that that team going. And I know you're being a little modest, but when it comes to hazmat, Keen is responsible for more than Keen. Yeah, there's uh, like I said, I think there's nineteen to twenty three communities we're responsible for. Um, when you look at any type of grant like that, they look regionally. What can you do regionally? And we happen to be the, you know, the only full-time department in this area. Swansea has just hired on a, a new chief uh, full-time. And most of the areas around here are volunteers, so it's very difficult for them to be able to get the training and the equipment they need to be able to operate. So we cover all those towns, and, and all of the fire departments work well with us. It's not like we have to uh, compete with anybody. They, they're ready to help, and they call us when they need us. So we had a couple incidents, for example, in the train engine went into the river recently or you had a leak by the Keen Sentinel, mm -hmm. all hazmat things, bingo, rush to, quite prepared? Yeah, we, uh, like I said, we, we have a pretty good team and the Deputy Howard runs the, the uh, hazardous materials team along with some of our uh, 
lieutenants that we have and a couple of firefighters that actually run the team, they all do a great job keeping everybody trained. We, we do a two-day refresher every year. This hap year happened to be at Markham Image, where they put in some new tanks of uh, methyl ethyl ketone, which is a pretty, pretty good chemical <laughs> to have. Um, but they've been great. and We've had some incidents down there. We've all worked together, and it's, it's gone well. And let's go to the other one a lot of people don't normally think about. We have a lot of construction in Keene and tunnel collapse. In big cities, you always have someone, usually once or twice a year, they'll get injured because some tunnel collapse because they're not following safety procedures. How is the fire department trained for, for tunnel collapse and other construction site injuries? Well, every, every collapse is different. It depends on the structure. It depends on whether it is a structure or if it's just dirt. But uh, we have a lot of people trained in technical rescues, which is high angle rescue. We have them trained in below grade confined space rescue. And again, uh, through grants, we've been able to accumulate all the tools we need uh, to be able to perform that type of function in, with the training that our people have. It's not one of those things that we do every day, so it's very difficult to, to maintain your training. But for the most part, our people are very well trained in that, and we've done some uh, scenarios with it where we've actually gone down to Public Works land at 580 Main or behind it. 560, I believe, is the number down there, and dug trenches and done our work there. And, it's worked out pretty well. For most people, they can care less for the other 364 days of the year. When that day happens, hopefully it doesn't happen, but when that day right. happens, they want you better than 100% trained. Yeah, th th there's a lot of areas that people don't understand are confined space. It's not only below ground or in structures where public service goes in, um, but, but it, b above ground tanks, uh, oil tanks, and those types of things. We had an explosion back a few years ago down on uh, Rose Lane in, a, in an oil tank. They were cleaning it, and uh, that is a confined space rescue. Luckily, the guy had, that was involved in that was able to get out. He was injured very badly, but he was able to get out on his own. And also when you're talking about um, the hazmat, it takes a lot of technical equipment. And, that can, and we were talking in the past on the city council, there's a lot of community that, that gets the equipment, but they can't afford to maintain it, so the equipment just rots on the shelf. Yeah, the maintenance, the calibrations. Um, just the meters alone, we have, I want to say, five or six at this point. We've, we've bought and retired some of them because they're just too expensive to maintain. But the sensors that go in them, if you go out to a call and you have a sensor that gets overloaded, you have to replace them, and they get rather expensive. And just the calibration um, gases that we use in some of them, just one, one alone is a little small bottle is $250. So it's, it, it is very expensive to maintain it. And it's really important because some of the, um, the sensitivity of some of that equipment, when you stick it in the room, you want to know what type of um, oxygen, not oxygen, but hazardous gas or whatever in that room. Yeah, there's ways of doing that. But most of the gases are looking mm -hmm. at explosive levels, that type of thing. And if there are a certain level, uh, if oxygen is depleted because of that chemical, we need to know that. Uh, but the guys are, are very well trained in that, that pattern. We use the meters even on regular structure fires to make sure the carbon monoxide is has uh, dissipated out of the building so we can go in um, and there's some new chemicals that they're uh, coming up with now which is cyanide poisoning and that type of thing that they're coming is coming to light yeah, and that would be the other one dangerous meth labs and the other chemicals that go with those yeah we we've been pretty lucky um, knock on wood <laughs> in this area uh, the police department and the fire department get along very well and when we have an issue like that we always work together so it's it's a it's a very planned out process when we arrive on scene. It's not just to go running in because people get hurt that way. What we're going to do is we've got about a three minute segment. This is um, for the Lighthouse Fanatics. And then <laughs> when we come back, we'll have a few minutes and we'll talk about your connection with Vermont Yankee. Sure. And there, so, where we do is just take a few pictures and as always, trying to get people guilty, feeling guilty about staying home.
Okay, we got a few minutes left. Vermont Yankee. There's a, we have some people that like Vermont Yankee. There's other people that are in a panic that we're going to have a, a Three Mile Island or a Chernobyl. What is the um, relationship between Keene and the, the other communities in Vermont Yankee? Well, Keene happens to be the host community for Vermont Yankee, and what that means is, is that if there was an incident at Vermont Yankee where there was a release, um, those people, there's a plan in place for those people to come to the city of Keene, and we would set up our, our decon area and do the decontamination at that area. Uh, Vermont Yankee has been very good over the years with the state of New Hampshire, Homeland Security again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what they'll do is uh, they give the state of New Hampshire money to distribute throughout the communities. And again, we get a grant. Usually every year we, we get a considerable grant to be able to take care of that, train our people in radiological uh, monitoring, um, setups, and those types of things, and e, uh, emergency management training. I, I know that you know the past mayor and myself and a few others from the city went over to Vermont Yankee for a tour. And I was never really up to speed on, on nuclear power <laughs> myself. But I can tell you that I was a lot more comfortable after that after that tour of uh, the ability of terrorist activity or that type of thing or a release, mm -hmm. an actual release in that area. Uh, it's amazing the amount of safety standards that they put into that structure um, to be able to protect those those nuclear rods. And do you coordinate in Vermont Yankee? Do they normally coordinate drills each year? Yeah, we the federal government ha mandates that there's certain drills put on annually. Uh, this year coming up, we have an emergency management, uh, emergency operations center drill coming up this year that we will be tested through the federal government. And that happens every two years, and then on, on the next year we'll do an actual reception center set up where all the decontamination uh, um, plans are put into place and we set up the entire operation. So like you said, Vermont Yankee <coughs> funds a lot of this stuff, so it's not borne by the taxpayers. They fund it all. They fund, uh, it, they all. fund it all for us. Uh, we don't pay... The city of Keene doesn't pay a dime to put out for that. So we've got about 30 seconds left. Is there anything that you'd want to say that you felt that was important, whether it's Mont Yankee or Hazmat or the new fire station? I don't know what the exact date is at this point. However, I'll be inviting everybody to the open house of the new fire station, <laughs> and uh, we're really looking forward to that. That's going to take up a lot of our time over the next, next year, and we're really excited about it. And I want to invite you back in the future with the um, fire chief from um, fire Southwest Mutual Aid. Yes. And I think that's important. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we got it down to five seconds. <laughs>